Bertrand, I know that you have a plane waiting for you for Zurich, so I would like to ask you the first, the first question, and uh, if you want, it is a provocative one. Now, differently from what we have been saying, we are not under, under uh, conditions of confidentiality. We are even televised, so I, I leave you to your Swiss spirit to decide whether you want to be uh, uh, a bit covered or completely covered in your, in your, in your statement. Now, it happens that you are working a lot with, with government with your, with, uh, for your measures. Normally, in central banks, we consider this to be uh, something uh, which we don't, do not do often. You, know? you will almost speak, it is like the devil and the holy water, so to speak. Now, what was your experience working with, uh, with uh, colleagues coming from, from government on macroprudential policy? Yes. Okay. Uh, I think I can uh, very well answer this question. Uh, I think the first aspect is that, and it is in the public domain, our initial idea was that the SNB would have the full decision power on the CCYB. Okay, it's in the public domain. <laughs> Then there was, of course, a discussion, and, and uh, Switzerland has a long tradition that uh, power concentration is bad, okay? And we came to an arrangement uh, with, uh, I would say, shared uh, powers, and uh, just to be very specific on the arrangement, SNBs make a recommendation to uh, the government on whether to activate or not the CCYB, whether it makes a recommendation on the level and on the implementation deadline. And we make a first draft, we go to FINMA, which is the banking supervisor in Switzerland, and based on their uh, position, we make the final proposal to the Federal Council. Okay, so it's not a simple arrangement. I think the positive aspect uh, on, uh, on this arrangement is that still the responsibility of every institution is very clear. Okay, we come with a recommendation. If the government follows it, okay, that's the best. Otherwise, that's the responsibility of the, of the government. So now uh, the experience that we did was that the two recommendations that we made were accepted by, uh, by the government. Uh, it is also in the public domain that on the first recommendation, the banking supervisor did not support the recommendation. It was in the public domain. In spite of this, the government decided to follow the recommendation. But that said, uh, the arrangement where one institution decides is more simple. I would say uh, one of the advantages of the arrangement that we have is that uh, we, of course, come with a measure that is not popular, so having some broad backing can also help. Maybe I can ask you a second question, and then I will ask the same two questions to the colleagues. Uh, today we have been a bit discussing implicitly about two issues. One is the question of timing. Should we take decisions at an early stage when the problem, so to speak, is a, still a flow problem, or should we wait uh, for the full materialization of the, of the problem? It becomes a stock problem, but of course from a policy point of view it's easier uh, to raise awareness at that time. So w one is a question of timing, and, and if you want uh, the, the second is the, the question of intensity. Uh, uh, would you go for a gradual approach or would you go for an approach which is uh, creating s strong signals? I would say that what we tried to do was to come in a timely manner and gradually. Okay, our, our main concern was uh, to come too late, and then usually when you come too late, you come with uh, something perhaps that is uh, too strong, and it can even be counterproductive if you just come at the top of the cycle and 
you give you come with a hammers and probably it uh, it has negative uh, uh, consequences still uh, there is a trade off because when you come with a recommendation uh, you need uh, the public and the author authorities to understand why you come with this recommendation so something must be visible <laughs> something must be documented uh, I can just give perhaps one, uh, one example, uh, uh, and, and probably it helped for this timely uh, intervention in, uh, in 2013. At the end uh, of the 80s, we had a very strong dynamics on, on the mortgage loan market. And in Switzerland, there is basically no legal basis to impose LTV restrictions. And what happened is that uh, prices were increasing, increasing, and then it was, I think, in 1990, the government took uh, an urgent decision to impose LTVs. The problem is that the decision was very late and the market started <laughs> to decrease and, and the, uh, the LTV was very counterproductive because it was creating downward pressure. So I think that also, I mean, uh, uh, Stefan Igwes said uh, uh, this morning, uh, quoting a church, you know, you have to learn from history and uh, otherwise it will repeat. I think it helped also this kind of argumentation. Thank you very much. Jan, what would you say about these two issues? So on the one hand, your relationship with the political system, you have been issuing some recommendations to government uh, uh, before election it was difficult that they would take it, so to speak, uh, but more in general, what is your impression? And second, on the question of speed and intensity. Okay, thank you. Of course, it, it's, it's not entirely new to, 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 to uh, cooperate with, with, with the government. We, we have issued recommendations long before we, we, we had macroprudential tools and the macroprudential roles. We always considered it as, as, as a central bank to be, be part of our role to, 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 to issue recommendations. Actually, I think we, our first LTV recommendation was already in 1999, so it, it took a while, but uh, so it, it, it's not, not that new. What is new is that it's more formalized now, so we, are, uh, we have a financial stability committee, we, which we are, um, uh, our, our, our governor is, 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 is chairing that committee, and, and, and the ministry and, and, and also the, 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 the conductor business supervisor are also uh, represented. So this makes it new. So it's, uh, maybe the new element is that we have to cooperate and we, we are discussing, we are writing joint uh, analyses. So that, that, that is a that, that, new element. Um, but it, it's, I think it works fine in the sense that, it, of course, we know each other's positions. We, we may sometimes go further for our, for, from, from our, uh, given our own perspective and our own role, and then, but that, that's normal. So that, that's not, not really, really... Uh, uh, new. Uh, about your second question, timing and intensity, uh, I think it very much depends on the kinds of policies. If you talk about phasing out interest rate deductibility or introducing or strengthening LTV uh, limits, I think there is a good reason to do that gradually, especially if, 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 you, if, if this is implemented and, and, and not supposed to be reversed in the future. You, you have to announce it well in advance. People have to know that so they can anticipate. I can imagine that other tools, like capital-related tools, can sometimes be implemented faster. Also because you, you, these are often temporarily, uh, temporary instruments, so they, they can also be reversed. Although even there, I, I would also, uh, I can imagine for, for the CCIB, uh, if you really, have a approach where you, 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 where you activate it and immediately would go to, to say, 2 or 3 percent, you may be very reluctant to, to start implementing it. And if you start implementing it with a small first step, you can wait for more evidence. And, and, and there is already an expectation in the market that you're likely to further increase. So, of course, we have, you have, we have to discover how, how this works in practice. But I, I can imagine there it's, 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 it's some gradualism is also uh, the way it's, it's now included in, in the regulations. So the, there are good reasons to, to have it, uh, to implement it that way. Thomas, what is your perspective? Um, well, I think it's very, very important to, to start at an early stage, and that then implies as well, I think, that you need to move gradually, and I think that is the, the philosophy that we have taken in, uh, 
in Belgium. Um, I think by moving gradually, it's also important that we do not forget that the credit standards are set by banks and that if we put, a, if we put um, an, an LTV cap and things like that, we substitute to some extent for the banks, and I think that's very dangerous. Our Irish colleagues has already said this morning that if you put the threshold at, at 85, they think, okay, up to 85, it's safe. I think that is very dangerous. And that is why we took this add-on of 5% and not a risk weight floor of 15%. If we had put a risk weight floor of 15%, we would, we would have given an incentive for the banks to become riskier in their credit uh, granting. Because now there are banks which are really very tight in terms of uh, debt service, for example. They have a very low PD. They have very low risk weights. If you oblige them to hold 15% instead of 5%, say, for the same loan, they will say, okay, why bother? Why should I be conservative when I give my, my loan? So it is very, we need, and I think we, have, we did not hear about this, I think macroprudential can have also collateral damage in terms of the most important pillar, that is giving to the banks the right incentives to be conservative enough when they grant a loan. And I think mortgage markets are really very heterogeneous. One loan is not, the other, not, not comparable to the other, so they need to take every time for every single loan a lot of factors into account. So you need to keep, I think, the incentive for the banks as, as strong as possible that they evaluate loan by loan whether or not the loan should be granted, at what conditions, with which guarantees, at what, what, uh, what rate and things like that. And I think that is an argument also to move step by step. And with the measures that we have taken in Belgium, at least the add-on of 5%, I think there we, we do not interfere at all with, with the credit uh, policies of the banks. With the second component that we add, I think we are start already to interfere because we are going to impose an LGD which they might think is much too high, and then, okay, they say, okay, we're covered. <laughs> um, and I think the Irish colleagues also made, I think, a very important point that, okay, we should be careful not substituting for the banks whenever it is possible, still possible. So I think that implies that we move early, step by step, and of course, if the problem becomes so large that we need to intervene with, uh, with artillery, then we should do it. But artillery, I think, uh, it can... It can have a lot of collateral damage, it can be very powerful, but then it should be very, very targeted to the real problem uh, in the flows or in the stocks. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Apropos of uh, artillery, are there questions? Oh, there are. So let's start from the top four. So I, I start from John. I have a very quick technical question for Jan. You said that when Dutch, uh, mortgage, some Dutch mortgage holders got hit by became underwater after the crisis, it affected their consumption negatively. Can you say something about the magnitude of how the consumption was hit and the methodology you used to determine that? So the second is Erland. Yeah, I have a um, question or a, a sort of a, a thought in my mind on uh, stocks versus flows and in terms of um, you know, capital requirements. Um, uh, what, so, so I think um, um, the uh, Belgian colleague mentioned a lot the, um, the emphasis on, you know, regulating the stock. But you could, in principle, use capital requirements on the new flow and, um, uh, and uh, have a higher capital requirement on new mortgages that uh, are particularly risky in terms of LTV, for instance. Um, in the limit, I think you could have a risk weight of 100% on, uh, uh, you know, on a, a, a mortgage loan with an LTV in excess of uh, 80%, say. Um, so I wonder how, how you uh, uh, th think of that, uh, of that option, which would be more of an artillery, I, 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 I suppose. But would, uh, would that be feasible even under European law? And how would you um, uh, assess that? Then I think there was a question here on the third line. OK, 
Okay, thank you very much. Adam Grassel, JVI. I have a question for Bertrand on the uh, counter cyclical capital buffer. So Switzerland was the first country that introduced such an instrument uh, in the past, but actually it's not the Basel III counter cyclical capital buffer as we understand it today. And uh, the ESRB, for example, last year in its report on reciprocity has actually said that, uh, you know, the European countries and banks do not have to reciprocate the Swiss buffer rate because it's not the Basel III buffer rate. And so I was wondering, you know, do you expect then, is it something that bothers you that, you know, German banks could eventually provide mortgages to Swiss citizens without being subject to this rate? Or is there any voluntary reciprocity agreed? Or is there any idea to switch to more of a Basel III type of a buffer from this mortgage based? Thank you. Bertrand, you have still one minute and yeah. maybe ask uh, Thomas and then we take all the questions. Okay. Thank you. Question to Bertrand, actually, uh, on the location-based microdential policy. In Switzerland, in particular, I was wondering whether you looked around, whether there are any divergences based on sort of the, in different parts of Switzerland. And in general, what is your view about location-based policy? And maybe one, if I may, uh, I forgot the second question. I'll take it. I'll do it. Take it later. Thank you. So please, Bertrand. Okay. So I have to leave. So I will. Try to answer to the, the, the two questions. Perhaps I start with the location or zip based uh, measures. Uh, Switzerland is a small country, okay, so probably it's also, I would say, one, one reason not to differentiate too much. Uh, that said, there are differences eh, in, uh, in the growth of uh, uh, real estate prices, for example, Zurich or Geneva uh, have a different behavior and would say in good times they tend to increase much more and then in bad times uh, the decline is also uh, uh, more pronounced. Uh, so far we have not come to the conclusion that we should account for this with macroprudential measures. Uh, that said, uh, there are banks that have a strong focus on these two regions. And for this kind of exposure, for example, FINMA can, uh, which is a bank supervisor, can uh, uh, also control when it is setting a pillar two requirements, saying, okay, this bank has a very strong concentration on Geneva or on, uh, on Zurich, so you could have a, a pillar two requirement. Uh, I think when you start uh, with uh, location-based macroprudential measures, uh, you really need a good reason to differentiate because it, it complicates <laughs> uh, the, the policy. And then on, on, the, on the question on uh, sectorial uh, CCYB and reciprocity, uh, for the time being, uh, we are not bothered, so there is no reciprocity because the sectoral CCYB is not a Basel III instrument. Uh, for this reason, we closely monitor the, the behavior uh, of uh, lending by branches. Okay, uh, but I would say that the proportion, you know, foreign banks that is uh, that are operating in Switzerland, it's more through subsidiaries. So we monitor. Uh, the, the behavior by uh, foreign branches, for the time being, we are not uh, bothered. I mean, there is the same question, you know, with, uh, for example, insurance companies. Uh, it was also one question, they are not subject to, uh, to the CCYB, they are subject to other uh, types of uh, regulation. And uh, we have observed, you know, some, some stronger penetration of the market by insurance companies, but not something uh, that would uh, uh, bother us uh, particularly. I would also say, in a, <laughs> I hope you will not see it as a cynical, but in, in some way, if you think that the main goal of the CCYB is to strengthen the banking sector, you could also say, okay, if a foreign uh, uh, supervisor do not want to protect their branches, it's a problem. I'm sorry, I have to leave. Sorry. There was a question about the, the consumption impact of, of the, the, the uh, uh, house price decline, uh, and particularly the, the underwater.
problems. Uh, I'm not aware of a study that directly uh, investigated this. I do know that this has uh, that that um, uh, there are studies that that find that propensity for, to consume is higher for for lower for 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 for, for younger households, which according to, to to our data have have been much more underwater than than than. Uh, uh, so there have been more hit by, 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 by the underwater problems than, than, than uh, uh, older uh, households. Um, in addition, uh, if I'm correctly, the Bank of England investigated something similar uh, in the previous housing crisis in, 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 in the 1990s and also found this, this effect. So it's likely to have played a role in the Netherlands. And, and maybe a third indirect evidence is that, that um, our economy was quite strong when the crisis started. And, and, and it's, it's, uh, typically, the, the, the two reasons why we still n nonetheless had a severe recession is, is, is that it, it, this housing market problem, and, and, and the second that is often mentioned is, is, is our pension system. Pension funds were, were, were hit quite significantly, so the mills have, have, have played a role. So, I uh, hope I've answered your question. And there was a question on these uh, capital charges on the new flows of high LTV loans. So I'm speaking of the control of Francesco, but I think the article 458, which we have used for this measure, could also be used to, to construct a measure like that. So it is a measure, in fact, which leaves full uh, autonomy how to change the risk weights of the, the mortgage loans. That's also why this is a very cumbersome article in terms of justification towards the European authorities. Um, and I think it would be difficult, I think, to... to to convince them that, okay, why do you target only the, the new LTV loans? Because in terms of, of vulnerabilities in the stock, I think um, whether the loan has been granted two years ago or whether it is a new loan, if the LTV uh, ratio is 95 indexed, it is the same risk, I think, for the, uh, for the bank. So, um, and of, for, for the Belgian context, I think what we want is we do not want to this we do not want to forbid loans with an LTV higher than 90. There are, I think, we think there are too much of them now that we agree, but in principle, there, is, there can be good reasons why one individual loan has an LTV ratio higher than, than 90%. If there is a large securities portfolio, for example, which the borrower does not want to liquidate in order to generate the equity for the, for, for the, for the mortgage transaction, Imagine it is a, a, a CEO of a small company which is very successful. The, the shares in this uh, company cannot be liquidated, but it, he can use this to, 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 uh, for a real estate transaction. In the Irish case, uh, they, I think they, they had an LTV cap with the possibility to exceed this cap by, by 15%. So that is a way of, of, uh, of okay, taking this also into account. But... Um, yeah, I don't think that, that we would, would, uh, would want to, for example, now propose a, a capital charge of 100% on, on LTV loans higher than 90. Um. I, I, I am under your control. There are two questions. Time is up, but one is yours and the other is Benjamin. So it's a sign that the interest is not, is not uh, muting. It's a good okay. sign. I remembered my question to Jan. My question was actually about uh, non-banks, because in Netherlands, a specific situation, non-banks are very active in mortgage market. What implications are there for macroprudential policy, if any, for, for pension funds, insurance companies, they're really active competing with banks. Is there something specific about that, or does it have an impact on your macroprudential policy making, or there is no, nothing, nothing for that? Maybe a question uh, to the Belgian uh, colleague. Um, you say that you have m mostly a stock problem. Uh, so the existing stock of, of, of uh, debt is pretty high. At the same time, the interest rates are uh, long-term fixed, uh, 20 years. So most of the risk is actually in the banking sector itself. Uh, so it, it's a little bit like in, in Germany where we also have the, the, the high interest rate risk um, uh, in, the, in the savings banks and cooperatives. Uh, why don't you tackle these risks directly uh, by just saying, uh, well, this is a structural feature of the banking system and why not just uh, use a systemic risk buffer uh, because it's an extra no extraordinary risk that they are exposed to, so just add uh, the buffer to that and not differentiate between the different uh, LTVs because this is at least 
right now not the biggest issue, it's more the issue of, of stocks. Okay, about the question of the increasing role of, of non-banks, uh, you're right, in, in, in the past, uh, say, six years or so, the, the, uh, the, the market share of especially insurance companies, but also pension funds in, in the production, or the, the, the issuance of new mortgage loans has, has increased quite a lot, so I think they had about 40% of the market at some point. Uh, at the same time, in terms of outstanding volumes, it, it, uh, it's, it's still very small, so it, it takes a while before they, they, they build up uh, a lot of uh, uh, mortgages. Um, it's actually, we, we, to some extent, we welcome this development. We, we, we think that our mortgage market is, is, is maybe too much dependent on just banks. And it actually was a welcome development in, 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 in our, the past years when, when, when the market went down and, and it was more difficult to get loans from a bank, uh, to, to take mortgage from a bank, that other, other uh, uh, providers stepped in. Um, so so it, it is actually, we would welcome if they, they, they would continue to pay, play such a role. Um, about macro prudential implications, uh, well, it, it's, as such, it, it's, it's positive that uh, we have, of course, we have this LTV limit, and that's not just for banks, that, that's across the board. So, every pro, uh, so that they, they are also covered by, by, by that, and, and I think that, that that's for, for now that's enough. We don't have specific tools like a CCB or so for, for, for these institutions, which would need to be developed, but at this point we, 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 we don't see a reason. Uh, also because they, they tend to step in the market. Also, uh, we looked at historically in the past, where the housing market crashed in the 70s. It was also when bar banks retrenched, but insurance companies, they, they increased that sort of somehow, they, they, they provided some counter-cyclical, uh, so the, the, the natural role is, 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 is uh, be, be, uh, beneficial. Uh. But if I may immediately to react about uh, my question, sort of uh, second part will be about the level playing field. Pension funds are not subject to capital requirements, whereas banks, insurance companies are. And in they are, they are. Uh, so uh, borrower-based requirements are applicable, but sort of supply, -based, supply measures, uh, pension funds are not bound by that. Is there a risk that eventually uh, they might crowd, actually crowd out insurance companies and banks? Well, pension funds are subject to, to prudential uh, supervision. Uh, not capital requirements the same way as, as banks or insurance companies, but they're quite quite strictly supervised and that they have, they have solvency requirements so, so that that's uh, so that, that, yeah. okay. but they're formulated differently so it's difficult to apply something like a CCB or so directly for insurance companies or pension funds but you, you may you, we could think about something like that in the future but at this point we haven't then quickly for this uh, the systemic risk buffer so I agree that at one point in time we could denominate the capital buffer which is now calculated we could redenominate re it as a systemic risk buffer, but the problem is this is a dynamic one, so every quarter the banks recalculate. The composition of the indexed LTV changes because people reimburse capital and prices may increase. So this, this, the rule, the way it is defined, every quarter the, the capital buffer is, is, uh, is, is recalibrated in function of the risk profile of that bank's portfolio. So that if we would do it with, via the systemic risk buffer, we, we, we would need to recalculate every, every quarter a new systemic risk buffer. So I think this is technically already uh, the better solution to have a, a dynamic evolution of the, the, the risk buffer in terms of the, the underlying uh, risks. And yes, we want to, to increase the, the main objective is to, to strengthen the resilience of the, of the banking system. I think it's, uh, it's good that we have a, a capital buffer which is explicitly linked also with the underlying uh, risks, and again, the risks are not in the whole stock, it is mainly in, in some sub-segments and mainly in the high LTV loan. So for interest rate risk, I think that the risk is under control. The banks manage this with, uh, yeah, within the, the ALM, interest rate risk management. Um, so uh, that is, I think, another issue. We also have a, an interest rate risk reporting in, in Belgium to follow up that this every quarter. So um, yeah, that, that would make it. Well, thank you very much. The good meetings uh, tend to not to stop, but uh, it's my duty to give uh, <laughs> back uh, the word to you, and uh, congratulations again. Thank you. Uh, please don't leave. I have some slides. <laughs> I had welcome remarks. I have closing remarks. 
I won't attempt to summarize actually the conference because we've heard many views, lots of food for thought, and myself, I've learned a lot, I have to say, and uh, the question remains relevant. I think discussions will continue, and uh, with more experience, actually, we'll, we'll face different challenges, difficult challenges, and then housing market will continue to be the focus. But uh, regarding the slides, actually, uh, I have some, some suggestion at the end of the conference, especially for the brave ones, some things to do uh, tonight, but before that, uh, John has actually the slides, and he mentioned uh, that Lithuania happiness ranking points, uh, Lithuania has very few points, uh, <laughs> compared especially for Nordic countries as a country. But nevertheless, Vilnius as a city, as a capital city, it was, uh, I have to read, but I think in 2016, in 2015 was number one, in 2016 was the happiest capital across the European Union. So the residents of Vilnius are, think they are the happiest, more happier than uh, sort of residents of other capital cities, number one in Europe. And uh, for those who are staying tonight uh, in Vilnius, I suggest, uh, I'm going to suggest a few, few things. So this is uh, something to try in Vilnius, but I have to warn, this is very filling, it's very, uh, it's a heavy. It's actually meat and potatoes, so very international, meat and potatoes. And the second thing to try tonight is so-called pink soup. <laughs> it's really pink, <laughs> but it's very healthy, it's very tasty. It's actually called uh, beetroot soup. And for the dessert, I would highly recommend tree cake. It's not, it's probably for some of you that's a new thing, but maybe some know that. I think in Germany they call that Baumkuchen, but this is a better version because in Germany it's very smooth. Here we have branches. <laughs> <laughs> And so these are three things, three options what you could try tonight in Vilnius. That's it. That's all what we wanted to say. So thanks again for coming, for participating, and thank you.